You're two blocks behind first and second. We have more buildings to clear. You know our orders, There's Sergeant. There's barely a building left standing or not on fire in your zone, Cole. Is your sector full of... Questioning my command. The captain doesn't want anyone falling behind. Tell the captain we will join him when the job is done. Just give us the word, Sarge. We'll take care of him. He should be sectioned. Ah! Well, there's a liability. We're here to kill not our own people. Star cross son of a No one wants to serve under him. He's bad luck. Can it? We have a job to do here. If I can live with it, you can too. Selectman, how long have you been sitting there? Not long, Mr. Kelso. You look lovely, Princess. You haven't exactly caught me at my best. It's okay, Miss Lichtman. I'm a big boy. I know how to take my licks. Please, call me Elsa. Okay, Elsa, what can I do for you? I'd like to explain because I... I can join the dots, Elsa. Cole needs your help, Jack. The police department have frozen him out. Look, you're obviously a brave lady, but you can't fight all Cole's battles for him. I just wanted to apologize for... You don't have to apologize. You were right about Elysian Fields. Tell me something. What was Lou Buckwalter's regular job? He was a carpenter. He built sets for Arkeo, Warner Brothers. A set carpenter? Perfect. If you don't mind, Elsa, I'd like to get a little rest now. I've got a lot more dots to join, and it's making my head hurt. That's perfectly understandable, Mr. Jack. I hope we can meet again under less dramatic circumstances. I hope so too, Princess. I'd like that. Are you Kelso? Who's asking? Peterson, Assistant DA. You're in the wrong building, Peterson. This is a hospital. <laughs> a wise guy. Let me tell you a story, Kelso. Can I get the abridged version? My head hurts. You're a funny guy, Jack. What do you want, Peterson? A colorful character mentioned your name. He said that you might know something about... There's a problem with colorful characters, Peterson. First they send you over a drink, then they buy you dinner, then you get a phone call in the middle of the night for a favor. Try rubbing shoulders with some solid citizens. They're the ones you're supposed to protect. You finished, Kelso? For the moment. I'm going to run for DA, Kelso. The current administration stinks. And you want me to help? I'm looking for a DA's investigator. You get a gun and a badge and $120 a month. I get $150 a month now. I'm going after the vice squad, Kelso. It's going to get me elected. I've got something better. How about Leland Monroe? The property developer? Do you think I fell down the stairs? So the assistant DA is trying to make a name for himself. He's heard of Kelso's reputation and figured he needed a man of action to uncover the dirt that would get him his job. Well, he picked the right man. Kelso has dirt Peterson never even imagined. Now Kelso is more than just an insurance investigator. He's got a badge. A badge that he's gonna need. Heading out, we can call the nurse princess. Thanks for the patch up, princess. It might be the only R&R I get for some time. She seemed to like it. Okay. And head outside. Now to follow up with the investigation that Kelso was on before he was wounded by Monroe's thugs. Hopping in the car, we can pay a visit to Kelso's current, former boss, Curtis Benson. We saw Benson in the incriminating meeting we found caught on film at the defunct film studio. 
Time to get some answers. We arrive at Benson's apartment at 10 in the morning. Inspecting the mailbox outside, we get his apartment number. Two. And heading up the stairs, we can head inside this beautiful Art Deco apartment complex and rap on the door to number two. Remember me? Jack, it's good to see you. You've caught me at a slightly inopportune moment. Can we do this some other time? Back off, Curtis. Move away from the door. Jack, there's no call for that. You're smooth, Curtis. I'll give you that. You try to get me killed and you still manage to be polite about it. Jack, how could you accuse me of having anything to do with that? I want to know all about you and Monroe, Curtis. You give it up or I beat it out of you. Get the fuck out of here, Jack. You're fired. Who do you think you are? Get out of town now while you still have the chance. You have no idea what kind of forces you're dealing with here. I guess we've exhausted the passive options. <clears throat> Sit tight, Curtis. I'm taking a look around. Oh, <laughs> Kelso. Man, I love Kelso. Well, Curtis is looking, uh, comfy. Let's see what secrets he has out on display. Heading to the dining room table, we find a folder from Lodge at Hall of Records. To get all of the stockholders, I need to follow the paper trail. Ooh, Suburban Redevelopment Fund. This certifies that Curtis Robert Benson is the owner of 2,000 shares of Suburban Redevelopment Fund stock. Each share valued at 100 bucks. That's $200,000. Ho, ho, ho. What exactly do you expect to find, Jack? A paper trail leading all the way to Monroe. Moving to the desk, we find a typewritten note. Jack, you've made a terrible mistake. Get out while you can. I knew you were in bed with a lesion, Curtis. Now I know why. The California Fire and Life Company, in consideration of the premium of $1,105 to be paid per year, ensures Elysian Fields developments against all losses or damage occurring to Rancho Escondido in an amount not exceeding $221,000. So Leland Monroe and Elysian Fields took out an insurance policy with California Fire and Life, and then the entire development goes up in smoke. Coincidence? Continuing to explore, we don't find much until we head to Curtis's bedroom. How old are you, princess? Sixteen, mister. How old are you really? Nearly thirteen. You take love where you can find it as you get older. Love?! That has nothing to do with love, Curtis! So I might find your romantic notions endearing, Jack. I find them very tiring. You're finished, Curtis. That remains to be seen, Jack. I haven't told you about my new job, Curtis. DA's investigator. Who do you think the DA reports to, Jack? Get dressed, you're getting out of here. He's not so bad. He just lays on top of me and grunts for a few minutes. He's kind, and he buys me nice things. Get dressed, you're leaving. She will only come back. Now that we really know what kind of man Curtis is, we can interrogate him. I want answers, Curtis, so pay attention. Please, Jack, I'm not a violent man. Not a violent man in bed with a 12-year-old, and not a violent man. Sadly, we can't tear him to pieces, so instead, we'll ask him about his motive for fraud. I don't get it, Curtis. You're vice president of the company. Why take the risk? It's a simple business transaction, dear boy. Jack raises a good point. If this is insurance fraud, the only one who loses out is Curtis. He's the vice president of this company. His company has to foot the bill if Rancho Escondido burns up in flames. Why would he do it? 
unless of course he's getting something from Leland Monroe for it. He says it's just a business transaction, and that may be true, but there are ethical business transactions and unethical business transactions. I think even Curtis understands which one his falls under. He's trying to sit here looking in command, above all of this violence and other brutish nonsense. And yet, Kelso has unnerved him. His head is shaking. His eyes dart all over the place. Every now and then, he'll lift his chin, trying to retain composure. But then a thought enters his head. Am I really in trouble? Where will this take me? Do I have a way out? But we don't have to rely on his composure and facial expressions. We actually have the evidence to accuse him. You're lying, Curtis. Something happened at the company, didn't it? That's why you took the bribe. Bribe? What bribe? How can you accuse me of benefiting ahead of the company? The evidence we have is none other than the shares in the Suburban Redevelopment Fund written to Curtis Benson that we just found on his dining room table. He's a stockholder, so when California Fire and Life pays out, Curtis makes out. I noticed that the share certificates are in your name, Curtis, not the company's. What did you use as collateral? Those sons of bitches in Sacramento. They passed me over for president. Sent me here because they believed it was a backwater. But they were wrong. Los Angeles will become the capital of the West, not San Francisco. This place will be the city of the 20th century. And I'm going to get my cut, Jack. You're going to jail, Curtis. You and your cronies. We'll see about that, Jack. Well, fast forward a handful of decades and San Francisco's not doing too bad for itself. But he was right, LA did become a center of culture here in America. Next, since he's in bed with the Suburban Redevelopment Fund, he can tell us all about them. Tell me about the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. You're talking about the future of Los Angeles. You cannot interfere with these plans. Information, Curtis. Business people who have joined forces to meet the demand for new homes. What a pitiful schmuck sitting here practically begging Kelso not to interfere with his plans. He and his business partners are just too big to fail. They wield too much power. But even he knows that giants can fall. His doubt plays clearly upon his face. He's just as unnerved as he was before. His arm is off the couch, though, which means we are starting to whittle away at his posturing at confidence. But again, we have enough evidence to accuse him. You're lying, Curtis. They're going to burn those movie sets they call houses, and you're carrying the insurance on them. And how do you prove that, Jack? The evidence is none other than the insurance agreement we found on his desk. Rancho Escondido burnt to the ground. California Fire and Life is carrying the paper. Jack, the best result you could get from insurance would be replacement cost. The stakes are much, much higher. Is he right? He does raise a good point. Insurance payouts don't really put you into the black. They just allow you to recoup your losses. Is there more at play here than simple insurance fraud? Next, we can ask him about the Buckwalter case. Lou, Elza's friend. Why the big payoff in the Buckwalter case? It was bound to bring it to attention. Who could have predicted this particular confluence of events? Elsa Lichtman as the beneficiary who spurns the cash. The brilliant but flawed detective becoming her lover. And you, Jack, taking their bait. You buy green lumber and use it to build houses. How do you expect it to end? Mr. Monroe has a fine reputation for building houses. What would I know about his choice of building materials? So he pretty much admits that there's a scam going on. But hey, it was a good scam. Who could have predicted? Cole and Elza and Kelso coming to ruin it, but then he pretends like he doesn't know that Elysian Fields is building matchstick houses. Somehow, I don't buy that. And here we see him as the slithering snake that he is, both arms at his side, slouched back in this couch as if he's defeated, and yet his face is defiant. He wears a smirk, betraying that he thinks he's smarter than everyone around him, especially Jack Kelso, the thug with a gun. Right now, he may see all of the cards in his little tower begin to fall, but he still thinks that he's too smart to fall with it. Of course, he knows more than he's letting on, and though we don't have proof, we can doubt his story. Give me what I need or I'll beat it out of you. <laughs> it's all there in the case file. 
If you know what to look for. Very neat, Curtis. Maybe I can't work it out, but Phelps can. He may be many things, but he is one of the best detectives the LAPD has ever had. Your card is marked, Jack. You'll have an unfortunate accident if you don't leave town. Your California isn't the same as mine, Mr. Benson. Not at all. We'll leave this pervert to stew in his own fear. If anyone's going to be leaving town, it better be him, because he just gave us a clue. It's all in the case file, he said, which means we must have missed something when we examined the case file back when Elsa first came into Kelso's office. So hop in the car, we can head back to California Fire and Life. We arrive at 10.02 a.m. News hasn't spread yet that Kelso no longer works here, so we'll just head in and pretend that everything's okay. They don't talk about other people. I'm just going up to my office party. Gotta check over some files. Take the elevator. First door on the right when you come out. You know the way, Kelso. Heading to the back, we can punch the elevator button, do a little slide, and head upstairs. Inside Kelso's office, we find the file exactly where we left it. So, Curtis, what is it you don't want me to see? So, it's all in the case file, he said. What exactly are we looking for? Now, we read over most of the documents in here pretty thoroughly. When we last inspected it, the pink slip, the letter, describing the payout to Elza. But then there was this blueprint. Okay, is the secret here in the blueprint? We see a blueprint of the house that Lou was working on when he fell to his death. But really, all we find of interest here is in the top right-hand corner. 34 degrees, 4 minutes, 29 seconds north. 118 degrees, 17 minutes, 58 seconds west. Longitude and latitude coordinates. Maybe we can go look it up. Examining that pink slip again. Insured replacement value for the house is $900. Current value of the house and land is $3,500. Christ, how many of these dumps are we carrying on the books? So the house and land was valued at 3500 but insured for only 900 So if it was all about a big insurance payout, they really wouldn't get their value out of it. Who valued the land and houses? Is this accurate? I have a Detective Phelps of the LAPD here to see you. Have a seat, Cole. Where's the go-between? She's awful easy on the eye for a foreign girl. Does that private dick patter actually work on anyone, Kelso? It's not your style. You were always a little more direct. This is your dime, officer. Would you have helped me if I asked, Jack? A little chuck on the shoulder, shot of Semprify. Fuck you, Cole. Be a man. Why send a woman to do your dirty work? You're a cop. Why do you want my help? I thought a PI might be a little more discreet. I'm no gumshoe. I used to be an investigator for this company before your investigation got me fired. I'm sorry to hear that, Jack. I'm sorry about a lot of things. Is that an apology, Cole? It's a feeble attempt at one, yes. Look, Jack, it's a murder case and I need help to solve it. So what's it got to do with Elysian Fields developments? I ran it somehow. Flyers keep turning up whenever I find a domestic fire. They're boosters. Stiffing GIs for deposits, making them wait months for a throw-up house. They're already making more money than they can count. What's turned them into killers? So you believe me? This is why you dragged me into the Buckwalter case. Look, Jack, I'm sorry. But if not for me, do it for some of the poor saps who are dying. Or some of the leathernecks who are getting grifted. How about it, Jack? I know you, Cole. You're still beating yourself up over that metal on Sugarloaf. The metal you think you didn't deserve, but you just don't get it. Nobody deserves a medal. It's just the ridiculous situation you find yourself in and how you react to it. You think you failed up on that hill. But courage isn't a tap you can turn on or off. Courage isn't permanent. It's a tenuous and fickle thing. Courage and cowardice exist in every man. Get over it. You got it off your chest. I guess I have. Can you help me, Jack? I'm thinking about it. If 
The Hall of Records is the place to start. So have Cole and Kelso finally buried the hatchet? Will solving this give Cole some sort of solace for what happened at Sugarloaf Hill? We arrive at the Hall of Records at 10.21 a.m. But just Kelso, Cole still has to work his arson cases. His captain still can't know that he's still working on Elysian Fields. Heading inside, we can get directions. Hello there. You need some help there, sir? The Land Registry Office. Where is it? Just up the stairs. Thanks. Heading that way, we see a sign, Caution Repair Work. Yeah, that was us. Well, Cole. This is where we went when Cole found a clue on the chandelier, and then the chandelier fell. Looks like they cleaned most of it up. Heading upstairs, we can follow the signs towards the Land Registry Office. The place is a bit dizzying, but there's only one room we can enter. Heading inside... I'd like to see the company details of the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. Certainly, sir. Just this way. He leads us to a bookshelf marked S. Opening up the records. All those suburban sons of bitches ought to be listed in here. On the left-hand side, we find Southern Film Casting, Standing and Sons, Stanisforth Betting Agency. Now, moving over, more companies we don't recognize. We flip through the pages until finally we find an entry on the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. And heading over to the directors, we see some very familiar names. Leland Monroe, Curtis Benson, Dr. Harlan Fontaine, and Courtney Sheldon? Courtney, for God's sake, what's he got to do with this? How did Courtney Sheldon get wrapped up in this? You and I remember from a flashback that he needed to get rid of all of that army surplus morphine. And to do so, he went to Dr. Harlan Fontaine. Is this how Harland disposed of the morphine? Did Sheldon know he was getting wrapped up in this when he went to Harland for help? I'd like information on a plot of land. Okay, do you have the address? Not exactly. It's a new lot. I have the coordinates. 34 degrees, 4 minutes, 29 seconds north. 118 degrees, 17 minutes, 58 seconds west. All right, that makes it a bit more difficult. Come with me. (laughs) That guy doesn't seem to be terribly enthused. I believe that is in the Wilshire area. 34 degrees, 4 minutes, 29 seconds north, 118 degrees, 17 minutes, 58 seconds west. It takes a bit of scrolling, but it's not too difficult to find the plot of land. The lot number is 1876988. Unfortunately, that is just the beginning. We have at least a million lot numbers in the Los Angeles area. Registrations are in alphabetical order. You need to convert your lot number to a letter. How do I do that? Over here. Use this adding machine. There are 90,000 entries to a book, so divide your lot number by 90,000. Oh, great. Math. Fun. One, eight, seven, six, nine, eight, eight. Divided by... 90,000, yes. Heading over to the adding machine, we can brush up on our grade school calculator chops. And unfortunately, we can't use the number pad on the keyboard to get through this. No, we've got to hunt and peck. So slowly, ever so slowly, we punch the numbers into the device. 1,876,988 divided by 90,000. Thanks, Kelso. All right, punching in 90,000, then we give it a big old crank. 20. A starts at zero, so you want to add one to your number. 21. That number is your letter of the alphabet. Once you have the letter, find the right aisle, and you are in business. You do this every day? Well, I think Kelso is glad he didn't take up this vocation. So, 21, what's the 21st letter of the alphabet? Well, that would be U. So, heading on over to Bookshelf Marked U, we have to find the plot of land. See if it's listed here. Let's see what the site is worth to them. 1876988. We finally find it on the second page. The book value is 350. With the new home in place, the improved value of the property is 3500. They can make a killing, but how do they pull it off? 
certainly not burning the houses down. They only get 900 a pop. What's their real angle? But just as we're about to leave, we meet some familiar faces. Know why I plump for the caddy? The extra trunk space. One thing you learn in the war, boys. You do your talking once the smoke clears. Leland Monroe's thugs come back for round two. But this time, instead of a fist fight, we'll dish out some hot lead. Throw out the guns. They split up, and one comes around to flank us. Weapons on the ground, now! Whoops. Let's heal up a bit and throw out a few taunts. Real clever asshole. You can walk out of here or go out in a box. Your choice. You want me? You got me. One more, and he's hiding. $12 hat. I need a word, Courtney. That's okay, Jack. You, you didn't need to come all the way down It's here. important, Courtney. How can I help? Tell me about the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. What are you talking about? Don't fuck with me, Courtney! Jack, I swear. I don't know what you're talking about. How does your name appear as one of the investors in the Suburban Redevelopment Fund? You're out of your mind. I was down at the Hall of Records checking on a property company called Elysian Fields Developments. Their funding comes from the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. Seriously, Jack, I have no idea. Your name is there, Courtney, with some pretty interesting company. The mayor, the district attorney, some dirty cops, and your buddy, Dr. Harlan Fontaine. Dr. Fontaine? Spill it, Courtney. I want all of it. Fontaine and the rest. Fontaine took the morphine off our hands. Look, Jack, I know you said to get rid of it. But it's okay. I did something good for once. He reinvested the money for us. That's it. That's what's happening. They're building houses for GIs, Jack. I turned a mistake into something beneficial. Something that's going to help out the guys. Courtney, they're building matchstick houses. They're going to burn them for the insurance money. They'll probably stiff the poor bastards for the deposits. Please, Jack. Say it isn't so. Harlan's a doctor. A good one. He helps out a lot of people. Looks like he's helping himself, Courtney. You're the fall guy. Kelso had to lead his men at Okinawa and clean up all of their messes. Little did he know when he got back to civilization, he'd still be cleaning them up. Kelso heads home. He arrives at 6 p.m., just in time to get a phone call. Who's asking? Leland Monroe. I was wondering when you'd get around to calling. I'd like to meet with you, Mr. Kelso. I bet you would, Mr. Monroe. But I value my skin highly enough to not want to meet with you. Why don't you just send some more of your boys around and we'll have a nice cup of tea? You realize that I could make you a very wealthy man, Mr. Kelso. Better than $220 a month? I'm going to have to let it slide, Mr. Monroe. Are you haggling with me, Jack? I might be. Come around to my place at 9. 5164 Santa Monica Boulevard. You'll come? I might. Good night, Mr. Monroe. So, showdown at the Monroe residence. Kelso can take out three guys, sure. 
But how many goons will Leland have waiting for him? Well, if there's one thing Kelso did in the wars, he earned the respect of his men. And it's about time to call in a few favors. After making the phone call, we arrive at the car and can head on over to Monroe's house. But even though he wanted us there at 9, we arrive substantially later, at 11 o'clock p.m. I appreciate the help, all of you. We can reminisce later. I want a minimum of noise and no prisoners. No prisoners? This isn't Pele Lu, Jack. These guys are grifting GIs. That's what they do for a living. It's okay, Jack. We all feel the same way. It just hasn't turned out quite the way we imagined. Let's get it done. Teams of two at the ready. The 6th Marines creep into the front garden of Leland Monroe. And wouldn't you know it, they find Monroe's goons armed and hunting for them. The thugs retreat back towards the manor. The Marines push forward, hot on their heels. Motherfucker! That's a kill! Got the bastard! Move up! I got you now, motherfucker! Keep your head down! Real clever act! Hold the perimeter. I got personal business with Mr. Leland Monroe. The courtyard is clear. Now for that lovely meeting that Monroe invited us to. Knocking down the first door. We find an armory, but filled with a bunch of medieval suits of armor. Not much use that'll do for us. But we can pick through the remains to find a better gun. A shoddy. That'll do. Now to move forward through the next door. There he is! Blast him! When clear, we can knock down the doors to the next room. And who do we find? Well, it's that same receptionist Cole talked with at Layla Monroe's office. She seems innocent enough. Oop. You're a very sweet looking girl to be holding such a big gun. I know how to use it, mister. I'm sure you do. So how about pointing it over there in the direction of Hollywood instead of at me, Princess? You're quite the wise guy. I don't normally shoot women, Princess. How about putting the cannon down? Ah! <sighs> Great. Leave it to Kelso's soft spot for women to get him his first injury. I didn't think you had the guts, sweetheart. I was never very good at reading women. Now join the club, but we still have to find Monroe. Monroe, where are you, damn it? Knocking through the door, we can continue to clean house. Oh, dang it, but where's the shotgun? Ah, Kelso dropped it, and it was lost in the cutscene. I couldn't find it. Oh, well, heading back out, we can try to find a new one. Weapons on the ground, now! There we go. You want me? You got me. Heading upstairs. I got you now! Ooh, goodness. Stim pack, med kit, something. Creeping down the corridors, we find one door open to the left. This leads to Leland Monroe's private bathroom. And where there's a private bathroom, there's a private suite. Yeah, Kelso. That's my opening negotiating position. Ha! Oh, 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 
crazy son of a bitch. How did you get in here? I'm bleeding to death. Get me a doctor. I thought I had an invitation, Monroe. Your boys outside were certainly expecting me. That's my second offer. <laughs> you sadistic bastard. <clears throat> what do you want? I'm going to take a look around, Monroe. Then I want you to tell me what you know about the mayor and those Trojan houses that you're building. <laughs> he kicked him in the bullet wound. He kicked him. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> Well, with Monroe whimpering on the ground, we can pretty much have our way with his office. The first thing we see is a newspaper on a display shelf behind his desk. Next to this is a picture. The Suburban Redevelopment Fund. Remind me what they say about absolute power, Monroe. Fuck you, Jack. Ah, call me an ambulance already. And the gang's all there. Where are his friends in high places now? And examining the newspaper, Suburban Redevelopment Fund promises 10,000 new homes. Construction work continues at breakneck pace. Projected costs will run into the multi-millions. Dr. Fontaine, I need to speak with you urgently. Sit down, please sit down. Tell me about the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. It's the fund we are using to channel money into the development of new houses. Why is my name on the board of managers? Technically, you are a major contributor. Please, Courtney. Those houses are a sham, Doctor. They're going to be burned for the insurance. That's a scandalous allegation, Courtney. Do you have any proof? Jack Kelso? An investigator for California Fire and Light has seen them. He was almost killed when he found out what was going on. I don't know what to say. I feel that I have been duped. Who do you think is behind this subterfuge? Jack says it's a property developer named Monroe. He said it goes all the way to the mayor. You cannot have believed that I was involved. I don't know what to believe anymore, Doctor. I hope that you weren't involved. Thank you for your trust, dear boy. Be still, Courtney. All of your troubles are finally over. Let them go. Let them drift away. Oh, so Fontaine murdered Courtney. Would Courtney still be alive if Kelso hadn't confronted him? And what does it say that Courtney was killed in the same way that he put his fellow Marines out of their misery on Sugarloaf Hill by being given an overdose of morphine? How could Courtney have been so naive a hero on Sugarloaf Hill, a man respected by all his other fellow men, a man with no fear, but a man when back in California who's played as a patsy. Turning around, we can examine Leland's desk inside a manila envelope and find a bunch of crossed out names. But we recognize some of these names. Morelli, Steffens. These are the names of the homeowners who refused to sell their houses to Elysian Fields. Some sold up. Oh. The others obviously didn't know the links these sons of bitches would go to. He's been crossing them off. Obstacles to his master plan. Taking them out. Moving over to the safe. Ooh. So this was what he was racing for. A big stack of money. Next to the money, we find a few items in the notebook. That's a hell of a payroll. And whose name do we see oh. on payroll? Top of the list. Roy Earl. We also see Worrell and a number of other dirty cops on this list. Earl's on here three times. December, May, and September. So this is what Roy got by handing over Cole. A steady payout. And next to this... I'm guessing Vincent's portfolio is only a fraction the size of yours, Monroe. More stock certificates for the Suburban Redevelopment Fund, but these are blank. Blank checks that he could fill out to anyone. Anyone who decides to help him 
or to himself. And above this is a City of Los Angeles police file. Criminal intelligence report on Dr. Harlan Fontaine. Dr. Harlan J. Fontaine is implicated in the supply and distribution of narcotics in the greater LA County area. In his capacity as a clinical psychiatrist, he has dispensed large quantities of contraband morphine to drug dealers and users under the pretext of prescribing treatment for his patients. Between July 18th and September 3rd of 1947, 22 suspects arrested for narcotics possession claimed that the drugs were medications given to them to alleviate the symptoms of various psychiatric illnesses. Several showed paperwork to this effect. No pattern was noticed by arresting officers, however, and no further action taken since each charge amounted to no more than a misdemeanor, and the suspects were processed across four separate divisions, Central Hollywood University and Highland Park. On September 7, 1947, after a lengthy interrogation, suspect Reginald Barkley offered the name of an associate he knew only as Doc Fontaine. See interview transcript May 10, 1947. Barkley stated that Fontaine was the selling party in a deal he brokered with Willie Baines Foster, yet to be apprehended. Foster is known to LAPD administrative vice as a high-ranking courier for Meyer Harris Cohen, Mickey Cohen. On August 29th, again on September 6th, and then again on September 12th, 1947, Dr. Fontaine visited a men's haberdashery on Sunset Boulevard, a haberdashery known to be owned and operated by Meyer Harris Cohen. On all three occasions, Dr. Fontaine was inside for more than an hour. Two days after his final visit on September 14th, a shipment of morphine with a street value of $4,000 was moved from a house in Brentwood to an East Downtown Warehouse, whereupon it disappeared. It is the opinion of this officer that Dr. Harlan Fontaine is a significant figure in the supply and distribution of narcotics in Los Angeles, with close ties to organized crime. I recommend that he be kept under close surveillance until such time as a comprehensive legal brief can be assembled. Yours sincerely, Roy Earl. Smart. Keep the dirt on Fontaine under lock and key. This is your insurance. So Roy provided them with more than just a fall guy. He ingratiated himself to Leland Monroe by providing dirt on Fontaine. Dirt that Monroe could leverage to get Fontaine to do whatever he wanted. What exactly did Monroe get Fontaine to do? It can't be stopped, Council. There's too much money at stake. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, Monroe. Ask the Emperor of Japan. Have some fucking mercy! Operator, put me through to Phelps, arson squad. Yeah, Biggs, it's Jack. I'm at Monroe's. He's in a talkative mood. If you get here in a hurry, you might get something before he bleeds to death. <coughs> Elsa. Oh, thank God. Where? Fontaine. Dead? <laughs> Former patient. So that crazy son of a bitch finally came back for a checkup. It's Monroe. He's raving. You want information, cocksucker. You get me some medical help. I've got to go, Herschel. Monroe's negotiating again. Do you want my final offer, Leland? Tell me how I find the guy who has Elsa. Not Casey. He did whatever Fontaine asked. He had some kind of power over him. He, he, he did all the fires and then okay, he went Monroe. off the rails. I don't have a fucking name! He worked at the bug sprayer. Get me a goddamn doctor! Kelso, you son of a whore! Get me a goddamn doctor! And the pieces fall together. Roy gave Leland Monroe dirt on Fontaine. Monroe used the dirt on Fontaine to get Fontaine to find someone to burn down the houses. The houses on his little list. The houses he had checked off. Fontaine used his capacity as a psychiatrist to find one of his more damaged patients, whom he had control over, to do all the fires. But then he lost control. What was it we heard over the phone? Someone kidnapped Elsa? And Fontaine was dead? 
Monroe seemed to think that the mental patient killed him. But who was this mental patient? Monroe couldn't give us a name. He only gave us one clue. He used to work as a bug sprayer. To find Elsa, we have to find this bug sprayer. We'll pick up the story after a slight intermission in an upcoming episode. I publish many videos each and every week, so if you don't want to miss it, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you feel like you're still not getting notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with each new piece of content that I publish. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes and in a wide array of colors. They come on other items as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new episodes.